Welcome back to the Law School Toolbox Podcast. Today we are talking about financial realities with starting law school and ways to save money. Your Law School Toolbox hosts are Allison Monahan and Lee Burgess. That's me. We are here to demystify the law school and early legal career experience so you'll be the best law student and lawyer you can be. We're the co-creators of the Law School Toolbox, the Bar Exam Toolbox, and the career-related website Career Dicta. Allison also runs the Girl's Guide to Law School. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review or rating on your favorite listening app. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can reach us via the contact form on lawschooltoolbox.com, and we'd love to hear from you. And with that, let's get started. Welcome back to the Law School Toolbox podcast. Today, we're talking about getting your finances in order for law school because it can be a very challenging aspect of the law school experience. So Lee, what do you think is really challenging about dealing with money in law school? Well, I think it kind of depends on your situation, but I think it's challenging no matter what situation you're coming from. So you may be coming straight out of college where you are used to living off of student loans and living like a student, um, which can be good, but law school can seem more expensive in a lot of ways. You might be moving to a new metropolitan area. Um, You might find that costs go up because you're not living in a dorm. Like There are lots of different factors that can make finances a little more challenging. Or maybe grad school is your responsibility where you're, maybe your family was able to help you with undergrad. So then it can be a different reality for sure. You might also be coming from a situation, um, and Allison and you and I both had worked before law school, but you may have been working and making right. money and then going back to school. That can be a shock. It, it's a bit of a shock to the system. Um, to take out loans and live like a student again after you've been working a good job and uh, feeling more financially secure. Um, And I think the reality is no matter how you end up going to law school, most people end up taking on some sort of debt. And the problem is that the debt can become huge and really difficult to repay. So although it seems wise to take out all the money you can, you need to be Yay, free money. Free money. Yeah, it's not quite free as the interest rates (laughs) keep going up. Um, you need to be thoughtful about how much of a debt load you're going to take on because law school loans can haunt you for a really long time. And, you know, it used to be, I remember my parents giving me the advice of like, well, law, well, school debt is never bad debt because you can lock in these super low interest rates. It's not the right. case anymore. No, oftentimes, not at all. <clears throat> no, oftentimes your school debt interest rates are going to be higher than other debt you might take on, even mortgages or car payments or things like that. So you really need to be thoughtful about how much money you're taking out, what interest rate is going to get applied to that money. Um, Because when you start adding interest, amounts go up really fast, really, really fast. Yeah. And for certain types of loans, that interest will even start accruing while you're in law school. So yeah, um, yeah, you mean you may borrow a certain amount and then you get out and it turns out you're already starting to repay more than that, which is not awesome. No, scary. It's very scary. And I think a lot of people don't want to dive into these realities of the debt because it is so intimidating. And I'll be honest, I mean, I get it. I I don't love working on finances. It's like not my jam. I mean, I do it <laughs> to run my life. And ironically, I run the finances for our business too. But, well, um, I'm even worse. So yes. it's probably ironic that we're doing this episode about how <laughs> to you know, budget and be responsible with your finances. Well, I mean, I can be responsible and budget. I just, I just don't like doing it. But you know, a lot of people find finances really anxiety inducing, but just taking the money and kind of closing your eyes to what that means especially after graduation, I think is is really paying yourself a disservice. Um, I mean, if you have any friends who have especially gone to graduate school and are out, it can be good to talk to them about what some of their loan repayment plans really seem like, because it can almost seem like you're paying rent to your law school loans, and then you're yeah. paying rent for a place to live. Right. And there are calculators and things like that online that you can get a pretty good estimate of, okay, Say I look at the budget, you know, the overall student budget for my school. Okay, this is what I'm going to have to borrow. And you can get a pretty good idea of what it's going to look like for the next 10 to 30 years after you graduate. And you can sort of say, well, does this seem worth it to me? I mean, I think that's a calculation every single person who's going to take student loans out really needs to make. Yeah, absolutely. So when you are starting to look at this landscape and you are starting to get worried about money and starting law school... Um, Allison, what are some of the things that folks maybe even before they sign up and really get going in law school should start thinking about 
um, to make smart financial decisions? Well, I mean, I think overall, the first thing you've got to look at is how much is this going to cost you? And is there anything you can do to reduce that cost? And right. so, you know, the main, I mean, the primary cost you're looking at in most schools is going to be tuition. So are there scholarship opportunities? Is it possible that you could leverage a scholarship offer from one school to negotiate for financial aid at another school? You know, if you're looking at two similarly ranked schools that are both in areas you'd like to attend is one of them significantly more expensive than the other if you're paying the full price you know all these kind of things i think are really worth taking into consideration and this is where people get in those tough choices where it's like well you know should i pay full price at harvard or should i take a full scholarship at some other lower ranked school we can't answer that question for you right but, (laughs) but i think it is definitely worth you know, at least seriously considering if you have those type of opportunities, what is this debt going to look like? You know, what type of job do I want? What do I want to sign up for? You know, am I committing to work in a big law job for X number of years? Is that something I want? Is that going to put me in a career path I want to be on? You know, you've got to look at all these things. You've got to look at loan repayment options from your school or possibly from the government. I mean, those are getting a little dodgy because they're, you know, 10 years later turning out not to actually be paying off people's loans like they thought they were going to. You know, so these are all things you've got to think really seriously about and just say, look, does this make sense for me? Because I think, you know, the reality is for a lot of people, the answer is actually no. This just probably not make sense. Yeah. I mean, not to mention the opportunity cost of giving up three possible years of salary. I mean, you, right. can, you can consider working part time and going to law school. I mean, that's challenging. People do it. Right. And there are pretty good reasons to do it. I mean, if, you know, if you're supporting a family or something, that might have to be the way that you do it. Um, so, you know, a part-time program potentially could take longer, but you might end up with a lot less debt, which could be a trade-off you're willing to make. I mean, I think all these are really about trade-offs. Right. I actually think part-time programs are under-discussed oftentimes as an alternative. I think especially for maybe slightly older students who have work experience who could find a job working, you know, even 20, 30 hours a week, not even completely full-time. And, um really be able to balance the financial burden of law school. I think it's something that people oftentimes just don't look into because they assume that they need to go do law school full time. And a lot of people are really successful in part time programs. Um, I think if if you're really in a position where you don't want to take on $100,000, $180,000 in debt, if a part time program is available for you, Um, It may be worth checking out. Again, you got to explore these different options. Or even sometimes I've had um, known students who've done part-time programs for, you know, a year, a year and a half, and then switched to a full-time program so they could finish out um, their classes in time. I mean, there are lots, there are, I think there are more options than people consider for ways to put together the law school experience. Right. And sometimes people will take a full scholarship for the first year with the assumption that, okay, if I do really well, then I can transfer to another school or maybe I'll pay more. And if I don't do as well as I expect, but I do well enough to keep my scholarship, well, at least I'm not paying full price and then still not doing very well. (laughs) That's true. But again, like, you know, you've got to be careful because if you don't do well enough, you might lose your scholarship. And then you've got to ask, okay, would I pay full price to be at the school? that I wasn't necessarily my first choice. Right. Yeah. These are not easy decisions, but they're decisions that have to be made because they have huge financial ramifications in the end. And I think with, you know, the way that the political climate keeps shifting or not shifting, depending on how you look at it, um, it can be very hard to bank on the rules that are going to come down from Congress to help people with their school loans. And so you can't even really gamble on the fact that things are going to get better, interest rates are going to go down, or there's going to be new programming to help students with school loans. I think you need to be very lawyerly about it and kind of worst case scenario the situation and say, if I really do have $180,000 in debt and I have a 6.8% interest rate, what does that look like for me and my financial future? Right. Does this make sense? Right. You know, I mean, if you have a job that pays you pretty well right now that you kind of like, you know, and you figure, okay, I'm going to get basically a job paying the same thing after this enormous debt load, it's probably not a great choice. Let's be frank. Yeah. Yeah. Um, All right. Well, so beyond these kind of big picture questions, which we cannot even begin to answer for you, um, 
I think you can get more granular with this and look at things like the cost of living in different metropolitan areas. I mean, the reality is a lot of law schools are in really expensive areas. Um, you know, so if you're going to go to school in New York or San Francisco or Boston, you know, you've got to be looking at things like, does your school have subsidized housing? Um, are there places you can save on things like transportation or food by living close to school? Do you want to live alone or can you stand living with roommates? You know, you've got to be realistic about this. I mean, rents in places like this are just absolutely nuts at this point. Yeah. And that can be a huge difference maker in the amount of money it costs to attend school. So you really do want to take that into consideration first when you're picking your school. And then also if you're going to one of these more expensive metropolitan areas, you got to brainstorm some living situations and really talk to the school about what they can do to help you find housing, subsidize housing, things like that. I know a lot of schools do have some sort of you know, law student housing, at least for maybe the first year to help you with that, but it's not guaranteed. So you've got to go learn about it. Don't assume that you're going to be able to just like walk into, you know, a dorm style apartment where there might even be some furniture for you. Um, or that, that you may not be the case. To do that. Or if you want I mean, to, that's know, a good point. You know, when I was looking at schools in New York, I was basically deciding between Columbia and NYU, and they both offered housing. But NYU, like, literally had dorm housing with, you know, you have your single bed and you have a roommate in the same room. And I was just like, I don't think I can do this again. Like, I, no, you know, I'm I don't think I could have done that after, like, living on my own. And <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. you know, <clears throat> one of the reasons that I chose to go to Columbia was that they offered subsidized housing that was in actual apartments. And I was like, okay, you know, I can have a roommate. I just can't have someone in my room. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. It's one thing to hang out in the kitchen with other people or share a bathroom. It's another thing to sleep in a room with other people. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, I had a three bedroom apartment and, you know, we had three people living there and it was fine, but I could have done that in a triple room with like bunk beds at that point. No, my gosh. No, that would not have been uh, not on my list of things to do in like my late 20s. <laughs> so. No. So, you know, I think you got to you got to explore these options and really think about, you know, your life, what you're spending money on, all the different things. You know, this stuff really adds up. Like if yeah. you have to have a car, you've got to have insurance and gas. Um, you know, if you can avoid having a car, that is usually people's second biggest expense. Mm hmm. And, you know, that can be the one of the judgment calls about living in a metropolitan area is a metropolitan area may be more expensive, but maybe you don't need a car right. or you live out, you know, like in in the Bay Area, it's like, well, maybe you live outside the city, but maybe you're commuting 45 minutes every day and you're burning gas and you're got maintenance on your car and all this stuff. It may become a wash at a certain point. So you have to really run those numbers to be able to make those comparisons. Yeah, for sure. And then just thinking about everything, you know, your health care needs and things like glasses that we'll talk about, you know, getting your teeth cleaned. Mm -hmm. Like I know there's a dental clinic at NYU. It's like even open 24 hours. You go get your teeth cleaned for almost free at three in the morning. Yeah. You know, all this stuff adds up. Like, I mean, I remember every semester, basically by the end of the semester, essentially being out of money because you get these loans and you're like, oh, okay, you know, I'm flush for a little while. And then as the semester winds on, you're like, oh, I don't really have any cash in my bank right. account. <laughs> you know, so suddenly you're charging everything and then you end up going into debt by several thousand dollars before you get that first paycheck. And, you know, luckily yeah. I was working like nice summer jobs that I could do that, but that was a luxury. Yeah, I think that that's true. And... Um, the other thing you have to keep in mind is if you start running up those credit cards, you're paying interest on those too. Right. Exactly. Um, you got to be really careful. Yeah. Be very careful. I mean, I will say, I think one year before I had my big firm summer job, I did apply for a zero APR card to yeah. be able to carry ba a balance to the summer so I could pay it off. Right. Um, and that worked out really well. <laughs> but, I mean, yeah, I definitely, I've played that game many times when yes. I was in grad school and law school. It's like, oh, okay, um, I don't really, you know, I'm going to have money coming up. I don't really have it now. I don't want to pay 20% interest. Why don't I get this nice free card? Right. <laughs> and it totally works as long as you keep track of it and remember to pay it off before that goes away. And yeah, and then make sure you close that account before you collect like 10 credit cards. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, sorry, my phone is going off. I need to show <laughs> um, okay, the other thing that I think a lot of people don't consider is, you know, we talked about being a part-time student, but you can also sometimes get a part-time job either on campus or off campus 
their work study jobs, which can come out of the financial aid office. I tutored for the SAT part time when I was a 1L to make some extra money. Um, I have friends that have bartended, worked in hardware stores, worked at law firms, like you name it. There are a lot of options. And I think the one benefit that can come from working some, not working a ton, is that it gives your brain a break. You get to do something else um, that's not law school related. Um, and it can make you more efficient during other times when you're supposed to study. I just saw the Ruth Bader Ginsburg documentary this weekend where she was talking about how um, when she was a law student, first at Harvard and then at um, Columbia, Columbia, that she had a small child at home, but she said that made her a better law student because she would go to school in the morning, she'd go to her classes, she'd work, work, work until like 4.30 in the afternoon, and then she would go home and um, take care of her kid and have family time and that that helps keep her keep focus. And I think that's something that a lot of people can implement in various ways into your law school experience. Um, But you just want to make sure that you still have time to do the tasks necessary to be successful in law school. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, some schools and I think maybe the ABA for your first year has certain rules about how much you can work and that kind of thing. But, you know, one of the upsides of the development of the gig economy is that you can do things on almost an ad hoc basis. So, you know, maybe you want to join some app that lets you be a dog walker Mm -hmm. and you can do, you know, if it's the middle of the semester, you're kind of chill. Maybe you do 10 hours a week of dog walking and during exams, maybe you don't do any and, you know, over the summer, maybe you do more. So, you know, you can kind of ramp up and ramp down pretty easily in a way that maybe a full-time, not full-time, a part-time, you know, official job might not be so willing to let you do. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. Things like Task Rabbit, um, Yeah, exactly. Apps like that. I mean, the, you know, this gig economy allows people to kind of take work as they have time to take it, which is kind of, which is great as a student. Yeah, and particularly if you have certain skills. I mean, you know, if you have a background, say, in like design or something, maybe you jump on Upwork and you do some logos in your free time, stuff like this, you know, I think it does, it can add up and it is something that's a little bit more interesting. You just do have to be careful not to take on too much. Yeah. I also think, um, again, it can be um, when you think about the load of the loans, you know, even if you're saying like, well, but I'm only bringing home an extra two to $400 a month. If it's like two to $400 a month that you're not taking out in loans and going to pay interest on, that's actually quite a bit of money. We're going to talk about more of those calculations in a bit. So it's like really worthwhile to just think of it that way. You know, it's not all about like a $20,000 solution or a $50,000 solution. Right. You know, it can be kind of pulling money in from lots of different places. I think that's one of the things Um, you want to keep in mind that it can be like, you know, we'll talk about shaving expenses, but there's like shaving expenses that can really add up. And then there's also collecting extra money. Even um, going back to the scholarship discussion we had earlier, a lot of um, law students have written about how they've been able to find local um, smaller scholarships a lot easier than large grants. So sometimes, you know, I know at my law school, there's a a uh, women lawyer committee that always gives a scholarship to a student who is kind of returning after a professional um, break. And, you know, it can be $3,000. It's just not a huge amount of money, but that's still $3,000 you don't have to take in loans. So it is right. a lot of money. Yeah. And you'll see these oftentimes at local bar associations or even things like the Rotary Club in your town yeah. or whatever, you know. There actually are a lot of opportunities that I think particularly after college people kind of forget about. But it's possible that you can, if you cobble together a couple thousand dollars here, a couple thousand dollars there, before too long, like you're basically avoiding a huge amount of loan money. Yeah. I mean, it it really does add up. And if you balance some of the hustle that it might take to collect some of that scholarship money, maybe that's a better use of your time than trying to get a low paying part-time job. You know, I mean, it's exactly if you're working for minimum wage, you could probably be spending that time better somewhere else. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's worth thinking about. And if you're in your summer before law school, starting to investigate what some of these scholarships opportunities might be given uh, where you're from and where you're going to law school might be a really wise way to collect some extra money. Um, So you got to get creative, but again, the more you collect, You're just putting a dent into that debt, and that's going to make it easier to pay it off at the end. 
Yeah, I mean, people give like the millennials a lot of hassle about like, oh, you're going broke because you're buying coffee every day. You're going to Starbucks. You're buying that $4 toast. It's like, okay, I could buy a $4 toast every day. That's actually not adding up to all that much over the course of my <laughs> life, you know? Yeah. Like, <clears throat> like there are other, if I'm making, if I'm working and doing something once a day for $20 an hour, I've more than paid for my toast. So, <laughs> right. you know, think like you've got options. Yeah. If you want the toast. Like, hey, also, you can make it yourself. True. Yeah. So let's um, talk about the fact that a lot of students also don't appreciate that there may be resources free through your school that can help reduce costs. So I think the first one is like a gym. Usually um, your school, especially if it's linked to a larger campus um, of a university campus, may have a fitness center. You can either get a free or discounted membership. Um, that'll probably get you classes and things like that. Um, my law my law school, which had an undergrad campus, they would even do these like discounted massages for students. It was like fifty dollars or something, which was amazing. People would go like it was like all law students had signed up for it during finals and things like that. Um, schools usually have medical clinics um, that can maybe either give you lower cost health care or help facilitate some type of health insurance for your medical services. So that's another way that you can try and spend money because, um, you know, getting your own health insurance can be very expensive. Places that students start to just spend a lot of money, as we've seen, is just ordering supplements and study aids like crazy before you really know right. what you need. Where it turns out the library usually has them on reserve. Yeah, so you don't need to go buy like four supplements for every <laughs> single class that you're taking. You can go and check them out in the library Maybe if you're really dying to have one of your own of a certain type, you do buy that or you buy it with your study group and share it. Um, I know my law school at the beginning of the semester, they had one day where people could essentially donate their old study aids and they sold them ridiculously cheaply. Mm -hmm. I don't think I ever actually made it to the sale, but you know, you could for $5, it was like a fundraiser for the Public Interest Law Foundation or something. You know, you could pay $5 and get the supplement that was one year old. I mean, that's amazing. Yeah. It's true. So don't just go out and think that you have to spend hun- – and these supplements are not cheap. And we're talking about – No, they're expensive. Super <laughs> expensive, like $50, $100. Like- Although some of them you can now rent on Amazon, which That's can true. also be a decent – if you don't want to keep it, yeah. which probably you don't really. You know, you might be able to rent it for half the cost of buying it, which could end up being a decent deal. Yeah. So before you start just putting everything on your credit card, shop around a little bit, ask around schools, see if they do any used supplement sales, and use the library. That's what it's there for. <laughs> you know, you're paying yeah, for that library. People, yeah, that's what I was going to say. People need to think about what they're already paying for. You know, if you're already paying for the school gym and it's included and you don't have a choice about it, use that gym. Yeah. You know, I took a bunch of classes. They were usually cheap. I did like squash and belly dancing, weightlifting, like all kinds of different things. Um you know, your school may have discounts on certain things like computers, other technology. I mean, obviously, you want to check to make sure that these are actually good deals. Right. But sometimes they are good deals. Yeah. And oftentimes, like, uh, a lot of the main brands will have student discounts, too. So always, always, always get those discounts. Yep, absolutely. And um, I just was reminded of a handy trick, if you're, especially if you're getting ready to move. I've been cleaning out closets lately, and I found old technology. Some of it was really, really old, Allison. I found <coughs> a computer from my second year of law school. Oh, wow. I don't even have a plug for it anymore. <laughs> yeah, I think I actually still have my law school laptop. I don't know why. I also lost the power cord for it. I know. Well, I can tell you <laughs> but where you can I still get, have it. Well, I can tell you where we can, offline, we'll talk about where you can get it recycled and destroyed. But, nice. um, but there is some technology that is slightly outdated that you can still turn in oftentimes for cash. So I know that Apple does a recycling program where if your technology is not too too old so old phones or ipads or things that you may not be using you can send them in and they will send you gift cards um which can actually add up really quickly if you are <clears throat> getting 50 dollars for you know a couple old phones that you have laying around the house or whatnot you know it's worth it because then you can take some of that and then maybe that takes off a little bit of the cost of purchasing new technology that you may need for school. So worth right. being thoughtful as you clean out your closets and seeing even what you have that you can get rid of. 
And one of the things we mentioned before that I think is worth reiterating is you've got to think about if you're just starting law school, if you really need to buy all this new technology. Good point. You know, if you're coming out of undergrad and you have a basically functioning laptop that's maybe a couple of years old, you might want to hold off on replacing that because you're going to need to use this on the bar exam. And, you know, if you can have a one-year-old or one-and-a-half-year-old computer at that point versus a three- or three-and-a-half-year-old computer, that could make a real difference in the stability and that kind of thing. Um, you know, you don't necessarily want to be rolling into the bar exam with like this laptop that you've been using for three years. I mean, you can, right? but if you have a functioning laptop, why not wait? I mean, technology is always getting cheaper for the same amount of, you know, power and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, so just think carefully about, do I really need this new thing to get through law school? And if not, you may as well wait. Yeah, that's a really good point. Another area where people, especially students, can find themselves spending a ton of money is around food. Um, yes. And unfortunately, making your own food is much cheaper than buying lots of <laughs> prepared food. And so, probably healthier. And probably healthier. Um, I have also been turned on to services like Amazon Subscribe and Save, which allows you to get um, subscription deliveries for things around your house and also snacks and food related items and you get up to I think it's like a 10% discount or something like that if you do the subscribe and save so it gets shipped like to your house once a month or every other month you can kind of all set it up but it's it's in a way to easily save money and um, make sure that your house is stocked with things so maybe you don't go to the snack bar at your school which I can guarantee you that kind bar at school is going to be way more expensive than the box yeah. of kind bars it's basically like yeah it's ordered like on the Amazon. cost of a box usually <laughs> yeah yeah the the markup on things like that is just insane um yeah anytime I would forget to bring like my cliff bar or whatever I would just be like oh god really like how much am I paying 250 for this like tiny little thing um, you know, I think you've just got to think about how you're going to keep yourself fed. And it can be hard if you're going to school for the whole day. You know, do you pack your lunch? Maybe you can go kind of bento style, you know, get yourself a nice lunch box. I mean, it takes some planning, but in the end, you can really save a ton of money by cooking for yourself. And you're going to end up eating a lot better. Yeah, and staying healthier and maybe not getting sick as often as if you're eating pizza all the time. Um, yeah, and you, and you can think about ways to make this feasible. You know, do you do three or four hours of cooking on the weekend? Do you have something like an Instapot or a slow cooker that you can do things in? Yeah, so, you know, you can, you can get things that help you you know, prepare your meals. Maybe you get together with friends and you do some cooking on the weekend. Then you split stuff up and put it in the freezer for the week. You know, there are lots of things you can do to make this easier. Um, One of the things I really like about the Instapot is I can do a bunch of grains and just put those in the refrigerator. And then if I'm starving, I'm like, well, I can probably do something with this farro that I cooked the other day. Um, And hey, that's pretty, you know, it's pretty healthy. Yeah. Yeah, I know you love your Instapot. (laughs) So. You know, I love it because I could just like dump, for example, like brown rice in it and push a button and walk away. And 45 minutes later, I have perfectly cooked brown rice. Yeah. Like, I'm not going to sit over the stove and do that. Are you kidding me? No. Who has the time? Who um, has the time and, and like patience? It's just rice. Like it's just a commodity basically. Yeah. I, um, I've had friends who also do like salad making parties where they will, everyone will bring different um kind of elements to add to salads and then they'll bring like jars um, large mason jars and build salads Mm -hmm. in the mason jars so you leave the party with like five days of salad uh, for the whole week Um, I've even I did this with baby food when my son was young but we did a baby food swapping party where we all just made one big batch of thing of something and then came together put it in individual serving sizes and all swapped you can do that as adults too Um, and not just for baby food but I think if you can get some friends together, you can make it, you know, a social thing and you can also make it a money saving thing. Yeah. And it just involves some planning. You know, if you're planning it as a party, it's probably going to be more fun than if you're just planning it yourself. But, you know, there are tons of tools online. You can use meal planning things, apps for different types of food preferences. I would be very surprised if there was any sort of food preference that you could not find some sort of meal planning app for online at this point. I am sure. Yeah, I think that that's probably really true. Another thing that folks find that they can um, do with a little bit of time is just really shaving off some of your monthly expenses. You know, looking, do you need cable or can you use one of the many, many, many alternatives to cable that are out there now? Um, 
oftentimes if you call places where you get things like insurance or even cable or internet or oh my gosh i just literally i called my internet cable provider recently because they were they were basically charging me more and more and more every month and Mm -hmm. at a certain point it got to a point where I was like, are you joking? Like, what is going on here? And I called them and they literally, I have two accounts and they reduced them both by two thirds. Wow, that's crazy. For the next year. And the guy was like, yeah, basically just make a note on your calendar to call us after like 11 and a half months and we'll do the same thing the next year. <laughs> I mean, it was just, I was like, are you joking? Like, why have I been paying this much? He's like, basically because you didn't call us. Yeah. I think I did, I was switching cable providers for some reason and I called to cancel it and they would just started offering me all these crazy deals. I'm like, you mean all I had oh, yeah. to do was call to threaten to cancel? Yeah, <laughs> no, I was no literally idea. like, I could just cancel and like set up a new account in someone else's name who's actually the person living there. Like you understand that you, like, they're like well, that's promotional. I'm like, yeah, but it would be a total valid use of the promotion. Something else that people need to consider in their budget and where they're going to law school is if you need to travel home frequently, because travel expenses is another area where things can really add up. Right, particularly because oftentimes you're traveling around a holiday, which is going to be super expensive usually. Yeah. And Allison, you have an app or a website that like you helps you watch airfares, right? What is that one called? Um, well, you can do it on something like Kayak. If you pick a certain flight, if you have you know a certain day that you want to travel, they'll send you an alert. But there's another one called Hopper that I think just more generally, if you pick a route, will tell you like, oh, the price is going up or the price is going down. And they'll alert you like, hey, so-and-so is having a fair sale. And so you can hop on right then and look at prices. And that can make a huge difference because sometimes those sales don't last very long. Yeah, that's very true. Um. And then I think you have to look at other expenses in your life. Is there a place where you can get cheaper uh, prescription drugs if you take drugs for various reasons? Um, sometimes mail order pharmacies can be cheaper than another pharmacy. Um, and then yeah. one of the things... Or if you're getting, yeah, for example, you could get them for three months through the mail order instead of having to go once a month and pick it up. It's probably going to be cheaper plus mm-hmm. more convenient. Yeah. So worth you know asking those questions when you... You know, it's time to re-up on the stuff that we use on a regular <laughs> basis. Um, and then even things like glasses, which is something that we've been oh talking about. Oh, glasses. Know. Like, glasses. I'm still, re- I'm actually still resentful of the last time I had to buy glasses, which I think was when I was working at the law firm. And I swear to you, I don't know how this happened. I don't even wear my glasses. I wear my glasses like an hour, maybe, you know, at night, occasionally in the morning. Like, I wear contacts. I swear to you, I paid $600 for this pair of glasses. <laughs> That and hurts. I'm like, <clears throat> I still have them. I mean, I've had them 10 years. Luckily, I'm getting ready to replace them. Um, but it was crazy. I was like, what? Like, what is going on here? How am I spending this much on glasses? Yeah. So we had had this conversation. And a little while ago, I read the book Originals by Adam Grant, who is, I think, Sheryl Sandberg's co-author. Um, and they talked about this company called Warby Parker, which I kind of like read about, thought it was interesting, and then moved on. Uh, But then when it came time for me to get new glasses, um, and then you and I were talking about glasses because you also needed new glasses. I was probably complaining about my $600 (laughs) pair of glasses. Now I never was going to be able to replace them. Right. I remembered um, this story and checked out Warby Parker um, because I don't even wear contacts. So I wear glasses all the time. And so buying glasses can get really, really, really expensive and overwhelming. Um, And so... I tried out Warby Parker, thought it was great, and then contacted them, and we're thanking them for sponsoring this podcast today. Um, Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) So Warby Parker has changed up how you can buy glasses because they are selling directly to you through an online shop or in their stores, which are popping up everywhere. Um, There's one in San Francisco, and then I was in New York City not long ago, and there's even one near Radio City Music Hall. I was like, wow, they're everywhere. Um, But the thing is about their glasses is they're so much less expensive because prescription glasses start at $95, including frames, lenses, and coating, which is definitely different than the last time you bought glasses because there's a lot more than that. (laughs) Yes, that, that, I mean, when I hear that, I'm just like, wow, I really wish that existed when I was buying these glasses. Yeah. And they're now starting to sell prescription glasses as well. Um, I think with, with a prescription, it's like $195 a pair, and then it's much oh, less. for sunglasses? Yeah, for sunglasses. 
Oh, because yeah, I definitely need those too. Because being a person, <laughs> well, no, being a person who wears contacts, right. I never, and I have really sensitive eyes, so I literally never go outside without sunglasses. They don't even dilute my eye or dilate my eyes when I go to the eye doctor. And so for me, my worst nightmares, for example, I was at the beach over the winter break, and I got an eye infection, and I was just like, I like literally can't even go outside without my contacts because now I don't have any sunglasses and this is my worst nightmare. Yeah. So see, they are also doing sunglasses. So now you can do that next. Yeah. I'm, I'm totally going to check this out because yeah. I've tried the glasses. I mean, we both tried it. Yeah. It's kind of awesome. Exactly. But now, yeah, now you're making me think I should actually up for prescription sunglasses as well. <laughs> so one of the things that I was a little skeptical about was how do you buy glasses online? Um, because what I, glasses I think look cute in pictures oftentimes do not look cute on me. <laughs> And right. uh, to make buying online more practical and possible, you can just go to their website and you get to pick out five frames to try on for free as part of what they call their home try on program. So they literally just mail you five glasses in this box and then you have five days to try them on um, and get feedback from friends and roommates or even take photos of yourself. That's what I did. I felt like such a goofball. <laughs> I was actually in my car, like taking selfies with the different glasses on. Everyone's like, wow, what is this woman doing? Such a dork. <laughs> Um, but you know, when you think about, and I've bought a lot of glasses, I started wearing glasses when I was 16. So I have bought a lot of glasses over the years. And so often you have buyer's regrets because you go to the store and you try them on for two seconds and then you have to decide and then you can get home and you're like, I don't totally don't like these anymore. So I think, yeah, being like, able, why did I think tortoiseshell was a good plan? Right. Oh. <laughs> exactly. So it allows you to kind of sit with your choices a little bit. Um, and you know, well, I mean, depending how blind you are, you can like wear them around for a few minutes, but they won't have any lenses. So it can be kind of dangerous. Yeah. A friend of mine, actually, I remember she posted like five different frames of herself. I think it was the same glasses, but in different colors. Uh And she got votes on Facebook being like, which of these is more flattering for my face. And then she got the ones that people thought were most flattering. Yeah. I also think um, the glasses I bought were ended up being maybe ones, they were kind of like these almost pinkish frames that um, are not necessarily what I would wear, would have picked out on a regular basis. But mm. after getting to wear them around the house, it was like, I can do this. Like, yeah, you know, and then you have something that looks a little bit different um, as your as a pair, because I have multiple pairs of glasses, because that's like my thing. I don't wear contacts. So if you only have one pair, and then that pair breaks, you're screwed. <laughs> so. Yeah, right now, the like little nose pad in mine is falling out. And it's just like, oh, this is such a life problem. Like, <laughs> where am I going to get this fixed? Like, oh, yeah. And then now I'm going to get new ones. It's amazing. It's amazing. So once um, once you pick your glasses out, you can just go onto the website and purchase the glasses. Um, and then um, you just pack up the samples that they mail to you and drop them back in the mail. Also for free, they just give you a sticker and then you just send them back. And we have a URL. Um, it's kind of like the uh, the Zappos of glasses. It, you can just order every size you want and send all the rest of it back. Exactly. <laughs> um, and then there's an easy URL to order your own try-on. If you want to try out Warby Parker, it's www.warbyparker.com slash law school toolbox. And we'll link to this in the show notes. But other things that they did that I was kind of scratching my head, like, how do they make this work? <laughs> they, You just send them a copy of your prescription from your eye doctor and you upload it. Um, they'll call your eye doctor as well. And I think even some of their stores now have eye doctors connected to them. Um, but they also have this amazing tool where they like can fit the glasses to your face using photos on your iPhone um, or even from your camera on your computer so they can do the thing what do you call that word? You know that they hold up the thing to your eyes so they know where like the center of your pupils are. I don't know. Right. Technology is kind of amazing. <laughs> so I was like, I don't know. Yeah, how I mean, that this. totally makes sense. Yeah. It, it's just a measurement. I know. But <laughs> sometimes technology still surprises me. No, I agree. It's amazing. But you're like, well, that does actually totally make sense. Yeah. You could definitely do that. Yeah. So you, um, once you've ordered the home try on with the URL, you can also download their iTunes app, uh, iTunes app and order directly through there. And I guess they have this new thing for an iPhone X. I don't have an iPhone X, so I haven't tried this out yet. But um, you can use your phone um, to use a brand new feature called Find Your Fit, which uses the iPhone X's nifty camera. I know their camera is super high tech, um, which will measure facial features. And um, they will actually like recommend frames that are kind of cool. So, you know, as technology changes, I think shopping for things like glasses online is going to be so much 
you know, more realistic because technology is going to help us to even make better decisions. And then maybe my phone will say, these will look really crappy on you. Please don't order them as part of your five pack. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I was also a little concerned, like, oh, how will I know if they look good? But then I realized, like, as, as with you, like, I've had glasses for a really long time, basically since middle school. I kind of have an idea of what kind I like, you know, one of the things I thought, like, one of the things I liked on the site was that they go into a lot of detail about what, when you click on the frame itself, like they have a lot of pictures, they have measurements, they Mm -hmm. tell you, oh, this would be better for this type of face or that type of face, you know, and I was like, oh, okay, like, this is the type of face I have, probably I don't really want to get a very wide frame. Thank you. Done. No, it's true. I always want some really cute, like, round frames that... I, uh, I can't do I them. can't either. I look so ridiculous in them. <laughs> yeah. No, I think I think we actually have similar glasses. I, yeah, we do. It's kind of like the square long. Yep. Uh, but again, like you know what your style is. It's not going to be that challenging no. probably to find a pair. It's so true. So um, pretty much this is quick and easy. And then they mail you these glasses and they just show up at your house. And um, I've been really happy with the quality of the frames and the durability and the um, the anti glare and everything. I can't believe I paid ninety five dollars for them. To be honest, yeah. <laughs> so. I mean, I would like to just emphasize that I'm still upset about my six hundred dollars glasses, <laughs> and now these are less than a hundred. That's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. So, um, if you want to try it out, you can go again to warbyparker dot com slash law school toolbox and try on glasses today. And for every glass pair of glasses you purchase, a pair is sent to someone in need, so you can feel a little good about your purchase as well. But you know, the thing about like learning about places like Warby Parker is that this is just such a way that you can save money as a student Um, and thinking outside the box about different places you can shop to get what you need at a much lower price point is another way to save hundreds and hundreds of dollars. And each thing, I mean, if you save $200 or $400 on glasses and then you save, you know, on something else and something else, all of a sudden you're talking about real money. Yeah, it adds up. And it's also loan money that you are not borrowing, which let us emphasize, you will end up paying a lot more than you're actually borrowing. All right. So let's also talk about budgeting. (laughs) So I know. Do we have to? (laughs) Yes. Yes. People are starting to sweat as they're listening. So if you are on, let's say, the younger side and have never really been too thoughtful about money, it might make sense to start looking at creating a budget Or if you've been living a lifestyle where you've had plenty of money because maybe you've been working and you haven't really had a budget, then it's probably time to look at creating a budget. (laughs) So, yeah, I mean, this is the classic thing I remember they told us when I started school, which is, you know, you can, if you live like a lawyer now, you're going to live like a student later. If you live like a student now, maybe you can live like a lawyer (laughs) later. But, you know, basically, like you're a student, you need to readjust and calibrate and budget for that. Yeah. A tool we've been checking out that we like is called... You need a budget, which might be the best business name ever because I just love it. How much like, <laughs> yeah, we just named our business You Need a Budget. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so the people over at You Need a Budget were nice enough to put together a landing page for our listeners. We'll link to it in the show notes, but you can get a, a free two month trial of the tool to see if you actually think it's helpful in managing money. So, see, I just saved you more money because I think the other offer is like a 30 day trial. Look at this. The money savings are adding up. Um, but it's you need a budget.com slash landing slash law school toolbox. Um, so here's how it works. First, they ask you to create a goal for why you are on a budget. So what's your, that's the point of the budget. And then you link your bank accounts and credit cards, and whatever other accounts, PayPal's, you name it, to manage your money. Um, and then you can kind of set these goals, like to pay off credit cards or to save a certain amount of money to take a trip over the summer, whatever you want to do. Um, and then you can start to put together your budget based on what you want those goals to be. And the first step is you basically need to list everything that you spend money on, which can be very hard. That sounds like a total nightmare. Yeah, because you really have to track costs. <laughs> and I think now one of the things that we do that makes tracking costs even harder is we auto pay for a lot of stuff. You know, we have automatic right. debits coming out of our, you know, credit cards or our checking accounts. And so you might have to spend a little time collecting some of this information, but it's worth it because it's how you can make thoughtful decisions and even save money. So I went on the tool and played with it a little bit. And I think it is, um, I think it's really a useful exercise. And I think that you can learn a lot about yourself. And one of the things that I like that they do on the website is they're kind of like, if you have, 
you know, th- five minutes to set up a budget, if you have an hour to set up a budget, if you have an evening to set up a budget, they kind of give you a step by step approach based on how much time you have to start this process. So you can get some exposure and some information without really having to dive too far in. Well, and as with anything, I think oftentimes people are put off by this idea, well, I don't have an entire four hour session to create a budget. I'll just do nothing. Right. Um, you know, yeah. <laughs> so I think once you get started, you're going to be much more likely to maintain. And also you're going to be more likely to, I mean, A, you'll have data that you can work with. I mean, say you do the bare minimum for six months, that's still better than doing nothing because you can go back and you can see, oh, okay, you know, this is like where I was over budget. This is where I was spending on. And then maybe you get more interested in it. That's you true. Know? And then you're tracking like every single item that you're spending. I mean, I know some people get super obsessed with this tool. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they can. Like most things, there's a, there's a rabbit hole you can go down. But it's good. I mean, you know, you've got to really think about all these different things when you're calculating your expenses. I mean, you know, think about what you spend, like rent, hopefully renters insurance in case something happens, you know, electricity, gas, power. I mean, if you're living somewhere cold, that's something to look at when you're deciding which apartment to get. Does it include heat or not in heat, not include heat because that could get really expensive. You know, things like your water bill, your trash bill. I was looking at my trash bills in San Francisco the other day, and they've literally like tripled in ten years, wow, which is pretty crazy. Which is crazy. You have no choice about that. Like you just yeah, have to pay it's not it. like you, you can choose your trash taken away. Not to get trash taken away. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's like that is a non-negotiable expense in your yep. life. Yeah, other things to think about if you, you know, want to have some sort of a housekeeper, even if you live in an apartment with like three people, sometimes maybe you all pitch in because you decide that you'd rather do that than clean up after each other. Um, you know, but then you need to factor that in. We've already talked about internet, cell phone bills, cable, your like Netflix, um, all of your subscription, you know, fees that come through. That's why you kind of have to go through your credit card and and see what Lord knows what you've signed up for. I mean, even from a business perspective, you and I go through an audit sometimes what's on all that stuff and we'll be like, what are we paying for? What what is this? Yeah, what is what is this? Like, oh, we never canceled that. Yeah. It, uh, you know, I think obviously lots of companies have moved to a subscription model because they love it. You know, you pay them every month. But even things like your Pandora and your Spotify yeah. and your this and your that, like, you know, do you need three music services or could you get by with one while you're a student? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, groceries, how much you plan on spending on groceries, um, how much you want to spend going out each week to restaurant and bars, how much you spend on clothing. Um, do you... Are you a member of Amazon Prime? You know, are you using Amazon enough? Student to, discount. Yeah, yeah, to make it worth it. Um, what about household expenses? What do you pay to stock your household with toiletries and cleaning supplies and all of that kind of stuff? Uh, we've talked a little bit about travel expenses. You might need a budget for gifts, you know, because there are holidays <laughs> and things like right. that come or things up. like weddings. Yeah. You know, most people in law school are kind of in the wedding season of their life where lots of friends are getting married. And that's a gift plus possibly clothing plus travel costs. You know, that adds up pretty quickly. Like you probably want a budget for that. Yeah. And that's a really interesting thing because I think showing how the times have changed because it was a totally like pre-Facebook world that I was in early law school and during the wedding seasons. And I had three weddings one summer that they were three different groups of friends. It was like one from undergrad, one from my hometown, and like one from work. (laughs) So I just Mm -hmm. bought one outfit that was like my wedding outfit for the summer. And I like borrowed a purse (laughs) from a friend. And I like every, every wedding picture from that summer, I'm in like this like nice brown dress with necklace I had the whole thing you know because I was able to buy one complete outfit but you, it's harder to do get away with that I think a lot of people feel like in the social media world because nobody's posting pictures of me for their wedding on Facebook so everybody could then see right. that I was wearing the same brown dress to every single wedding <laughs> that I went to yeah I um, know I'm getting ready to go to a wedding that's uh, a friend of mine who's from her parents are Indian and so that's like a whole other wardrobe I mean yeah I showed my Spanish tutor what I was wearing. He's like, wow, you wouldn't really wear this normally. I was like, no, it's a really different style. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Need to be appropriate. But that's where I think services like Rent the Runway can become very helpful. I think especially for students, um, because, you know, if you find yourself needing a lot of different outfits for very specific occasions, you can use something like Rent the Runway 
um, to hopefully mitigate those costs. And depending on where you live yeah. now, you can actually go to some of these Rent the Runway stores and try on clothes. Um, I'm actually going with a girlfriend of mine because she needs an, um, a dress for an event. And she's like, why would I buy a dress for this event that I will never wear again? <laughs> so Right, or something like the Barrister's Ball. Yeah. I mean, perfect example of a great use of Rent the Runway. Yeah, so you can actually go, and if you want to try things on yourself, you can go. Um, to some of the stores and they will just pull things for you. So there are lots of different options, but that's a, the weddings is a really good thing to think about because when law school is a prime time for lots of people to get married. Well, this is a perfect example of why I think something like you need a budget is useful because we're talking about this and it seems so obvious like, oh, of course I'll probably go to some weddings. But I feel like every time a wedding happens, it's this moment, unless you've planned for it, it's this moment of like, oh my gosh, like how am I going to make this happen? You know, what? But it's a predictable expense. It is. It's not, and it's the same thing with an emergency supply, emergency, you know, fund, uh, emergency account. Yeah. Thank you, emergency fund. You know, most of the things that you know. A lot of times we talk to people who are doing really poorly in law school because of something like their car dying. Right. And it's like, oh, well, you know, I had car trouble, and then I couldn't get to school, and then I missed class, and then it was a downward spiral. And it's like, okay, that's unfortunate, but that's also pretty predictable. Yeah. You know, like something's going to happen that's going to require you to have to spend, say, 500 to to $1,000. That's not out of the realm of possibility for most people in an average year. And the reality is I think most people don't have that money saved. So then it becomes a huge crisis. And if you can use something, you know, a tool that even if you're saving $50 a month, well, at the end of a year, you've got your emergency fund. Yep, Exactly. Um, other things that we've talked about, gym memberships, medical insurance, car payments and car insurance. Um, parking is a big one, especially if you're in a metropolitan area. Um, in San, if you live parking in San Francisco, tickets. I would, <laughs> I had a budget for, uh, parking tickets, which I got a few a month and I considered that the cost of parking at my law school. <laughs> so, um, so that's something you also have to take into consideration. Maybe you use transit cards. Um, you do a monthly transit cards. So, I mean, these are just a few things to start going through, but um, you do want to start thinking kind of big picture about what's coming up for you, what's coming up in the year, and make sure that you have taken these things into consideration. Yeah, I think the more you can plan ahead and set yourself up for not having to panic about an expense that's out of, you know, unexpected, but not really out of range. I mean, for example, if you have a high deductible health care policy, that's something to think about. I mean, I once randomly stabbed myself with a knife, with a butter knife in my finger, and unfortunately cut a tendon and had a high deductible policy and suddenly had to pay out, I think it was $5,000. That sucks. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. It's like, oh, you're in pain, you're getting ready to have, have to recover from surgery, and also you have this enormous expense. Yeah. So it's just something that, you know, it's a trade-off because you pay less for the insurance, but then you pay more if something happens. So, but you've got to somehow be prepared for that or it's going to be a financial disaster. Yeah, that's a good point. So putting together a budget is going to help you handle your expenses even before law school. So if you're listening to this and you're starting law school in the fall, but maybe you're even still working, go ahead and see where your money's going now. That could be sobering and help you um, decide where you want to start um, trimming the fat from your budget. And you can use this website that we like um, to get a few months free. We'll link again to that um, URL in the show notes. Yeah. And, you know, I think we're way over our time we in are. this episode, but there are a few other things we wanted to briefly talk about. So I think one thing, one area where you can kind of pad your budget a little bit as a student is around holidays. Yeah. You know, whether it's your birthday, like Christmas, Hanukkah, you know, whatever you celebrate, oftentimes people will ask you what you want. And I think this is a great time to have either cash or a cash equivalent. Yeah, it really <laughs> yeah. is. So something, something like a gift certificate to Amazon is amazing if you're in law school. Yeah, because what can't you get on Amazon? Right, exactly. Yeah. And the other thing for people who don't even want to do cash, like if they're local, you can always ask for people to, you know, cook you meals that could be in the freezer. Um, so, you know, if your aunt wants to help you out, but she, and she makes great lasagna, like have her make you trays of lasagna that can live in your freezer that you can eat through, um, the semester. I think there are a lot of ways that people can help. Um, if you get a little creative about being direct, how you help that, or how they can be helpful. And, you know, that's a huge benefit as well. 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, people can buy you things like gift certificates to food delivery services or maybe a subscription to a CSA that delivers you fresh fruit and vegetables. Of course, you then have to prepare them. But if that's something you're interested in, that can be a great way for people to feel like they're really involved in helping you with your law school experience at a cost that maybe is not enormous to them, but would make a big difference to you. Yeah. I know in the Bay Area, and I think this may to other places as well, we have something called Imperfect Produce, which is a mm. CSA delivery type option where they basically give you ugly produce that doesn't make the cut, right. but is there's nothing wrong with it. It's just sometimes can be in weird shapes and it's at a pretty significant discount. And I've heard some really great things from people who have... Um, started using it because they're like if you're gonna like especially if you're gonna cut it up and put it in food like nobody cares what, the, <laughs> what it looks like yeah, who cares you're making a soup no one cares what exactly it like. exactly so that's another thing that you can check out if you're a big fruit and veggie eater all right so the last thing we wanted to talk about before we release you from talking about money is um I was going through kind of doing research for this episode and um Boston University had this kind of helpful um article that I linked to in the show notes, um, talking about like what money really means when you're talking about loans. So the, here's one of the examples of how mo- loan money is not free. So let's say that you spend $1,600 a month for the next three academic years, even though you could spend almost $1,800 per month with your student budget. So you're spending $200 less a month. If you're borrowing to cover your living expenses, that means that you're borrowing $1,800 less for one academic year and $5,400 less over three years, which may not sound like a huge amount of money, but on a student loan plan with a 10-year repayment at a 6.8% interest rate, which is not unreasonable for what you will see for some of your loans, you will end up repaying $115 per month for every $10,000 you borrow. So you go ahead and do that math up to $180,000 that some people will end up borrowing. So over 10 years, borrowing an additional $5,400 costs you $62 a month to repay or $7,440 in principal and interest. So all of a sudden that $200 a month, which you may or may not really notice, is turning into real money. And I think- Right. I mean, for three years, you can have your $200 a month and then you can repay it for the next 10 years. (laughs) Right. (laughs) You know, or you could get- a little part-time gig to make up that two hundred dollars a month, if you needed that. Yeah, I, mean, I think a there month. there are very few law students who could not find something to do that would make them two hundred dollars. Yeah, month. so that's what we're just talking about. Just be very thoughtful because something as small as I think a lot of people would think two hundred dollars a month is maybe not a significant amount of money when you're talking about the amount of money it takes to live and go to law school, but it can make a big difference when you start repaying these loans. Yeah, I mean, you could do something like babysitting in most in most university towns or large cities. You could be a babysitter for a couple of hours yeah. a month, you know, a few weekends, and you're going to make a lot of money that way. Yeah, I know. Ask my babysitters. <laughs> and not only that, I mean, people like, you know, the kids go to bed and you can study. Yeah. It's pretty easy money. It is. It's not bad. Not a bad gig. <laughs> exactly. I mean, and, you know, yeah, I was doing it as a kid. Like, certainly you can do it as a grown <laughs> All right. Well, with that, we are really, really out of time. So thanks for sticking with us. I hope you uh, learned something in this episode and that uh, we haven't caused you financial panic attacks. But it is uh, it is important stuff that needs to be talked about. Um, if you enjoyed this episode of the Law School Toolbox podcast, please take a second to leave a review and rating on your favorite listening app. We'd really appreciate it. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. If you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself or Allison at lee at lawschooltoolbox.com or allison at lawschooltoolbox.com, or you can always contact us via our website contact form at lawschooltoolbox.com. Make sure you check out the show notes to um, check out Warby Parker and also the link for an additional free trial for you need a budget.com. Thanks for listening. Good luck with your finances and we'll talk soon. Mm-hmm.